and welcome back now south africa's social development programs are too focused on welfareism and less on healing the social pain in a highly unequal and violent society this according to dr mampela rampele who drawing parallels from her recent visit to ireland uh, where she observed that the country has successfully complemented their political settlement with significant social investments that have done well in uplifting the living standards of the people. Uh, Dr. Rampele ponders uh, that back home with about 17 million social grant recipients and more than 10 million people unemployed, we need to look at the role played by government in dealing with poverty, inequality and unemployment. And Dr. Mampela Rampele, the co-founder of Reimagine South Africa, joins us from our Cape Town studios. Thanks so much for your time and welcome to Morning Live. Good morning and thank you, Sakina. So let's just dive right in, uh, Dr. Rampele. How best can we learn from the Irish reconciliation story, especially given that we have been held up for a very long time as the poster child for reconciliation the world over? But evidently there is still much to be done. So what can we learn from the Irish story? What we can learn from the Irish story is that the political settlement of 1994 that we should be proud of should have been complemented by what we committed to do in the preamble of our constitution to heal the wounds of our ugly past and second to establish a shared value system of human rights which in our local language we we'll call it Ubuntu. What does it mean to treat another person as you would like to be treated, given our history of discrimination. And third, what are we going to do, and that's what we had said, we will invest in developing the potential of every person, which means our education, health system, and our human settlements would restore the dignity of people and enable them to function as proud, confident citizens who know their rights and responsibilities. And finally, that we would then take our place very proudly as a society alongside other societies committed to social justice. So given that we are 25 years into our democratic dispensation, what do you believe we've done well? What did we get right? And where have we totally dropped the ball? What we got right was to follow our political settlement to its logical conclusion of establishing and building very strong institutions, the judiciary, the um, the institutions like the uh, National Pub, uh, Prosecution Authority and many other institutions and laws we've done extremely well. We've also done well in establishing parliament, the provincial system and the local system. What we forgot was to pay attention to the software that you were supposed to make sure that those institutions function as they should. This is why the judiciary in South Africa is so strong because it has followed through with appointing people who have the skills and who understand the rules, regulations and the values that should characterize a judiciary in a constitutional democracy. The same does not apply to the other elements, the other institutions. Our education system gets a huge seg segment of our budget, but we, had not, we have not invested in retraining and reorienting our teachers to teach for a constitutional democratic order. We have not done what Ireland has done in education of making sure that mother tongue education in the foundation years sets the foundation for people to know who they are, what's their history, their symbols, and their heroes. We also have not paid attention to the fact that 
having treated black people as inferior, we need to make sure that we undo that sense of inferiority, which we haven't paid attention to. And the Irish went very systematically through that process. Up to today, there are still courses, refresher courses, for teachers, for police, for uh, public servants at all levels. That's what we fail to do. So looking at uh, that specific uh, issue that you raise now, um, in Ireland, the conflict was Protestant versus Catholic. Ours was a race-based conflict. And, and as you say, you know, it impugned the dignity of the majority of people living in this country. So on that specific situation, how can we learn? W what is the lesson that we can learn to try and uh, reverse that tide and, and, and restore people's dignity? What we have to learn is to acknowledge that to have an economy built for 10% to benefit 10% of the population on a race base would implies that if we really want to have social justice, we should have gone for fundamental socioeconomic restructuring, not black economic empowerment. You can't empower people by giving them a small slice of a diminishing size, I mean, a diminishing cake. Because the people who have been beneficiaries, we have turned them into the ones who benefit black people. They are the ones who empower black people. You cannot empower people by giving them something instead of changing the rules of the game. We should have had an economy that is reimagined to be able to provide livelihoods for 100% of the population. What we are trying to do is a no-win game. There is no way we are going to be able to get this economy as it is currently constituted to create jobs for the 10 million people who are currently unemployed. But what we can do, we should reimagine how we can make our economy create livelihoods for people. And what the president has talked about, we need to see how by implementing this district model that the pres president is talking about, we can begin to make sure that people in in places like rural areas, where they are, what are the ways in which we as a society and the government can support them to be able to develop their roads, infrastructures, their water, their power systems, and to grow their own food and ultimately be suppliers of food security in the country. But we can't do that without paying attention to education, which is the key to the future. Our education system has failed dismally to transform itself into an effective and efficient platform for talent development. And the reason, in my view, is that there is still a sense of inferiority all the way into government, that we don't believe that poor black kids are as smart as any child anywhere in the world. We keep lowering the standards of expectations of children. Children rise to the level of expectations we have of them. If we think that children and we tell them, you can't do math, you can't do that, they won't. They won't be able to. But if you tell them, how wonderful they are. Whatever skill they have, praise them, encourage them. They will then be able to know that they are capable of learning anything. But mother tongue is absolutely essential so that they can connect what happens at home with what happens at school. What we have done is to create a chasm between the two. We cannot succeed without addressing our education system. And in there, we have teachers, many of whom came from homes where they were either child-headed households 
or no father in the home, as we know, more than two thirds of children in this country grow up without fathers. Now, in Ireland, they understood that the children of the troubles, whose fathers were either away or they were taken by drunk, uh, uh, alcohol, they needed more support. And that's what they do. So we need to pay attention to supporting families of single parents, child-headed households, by making sure our social workers understand that they are not welfare workers, but they are people there to support the human development of a people who have talents, but those talents need to be supported. And those are such crucial points that you make, uh, Dr. Ampele. One almost wants time to unpack each of these situations. But I want to touch off as many, uh, on as many aspects of uh, your contribution as possible. So to what extent do social grants help in reducing poverty and inequality? Uh, just from your perspective, the pros and cons of social grants, as you say, uh, we are too focused on welfareism. So let's talk to social grants. Social grants are absolutely essential. They are a, a support structure for people who have fallen on hard times, like parents with young children with no means to support. But if we want those social grants to play their role as a safety net, we then have to support the mothers, the gogos, and all of the people who are receiving these grants so particularly the young mothers, so they can develop themselves into independent citizens. And that means, as the Brazilians have done, they have a social grant program which is connected to the development of the people who receive them. The mother has to make sure the child is immunized so the child grows up as a healthy being. The child eats properly. The mother herself has to go back to not necessarily formal school, but they have to develop their talents so that they stop being dependent on the ground for love lose, but become skilled people in whatever talented area they have. That way, you are giving people the ability in the first five years of the child's life to be able to survive the trauma, but in the process to develop the skills to become independent persons. Obviously, the grants to old people, they're deserving. They don't have to be trained. But the m millions of young women who are receiving child grants, we should be turning into people who become independent earners of livelihoods. They don't have to have jobs, but they can do a whole lot of things that are possible in society, as the Brazilians have, in, have demonstrated. Well, Dr. Mampele Rampele, I wish we had more time, uh, but hopefully we should create more space and opportunity to discuss these matters. But as things stand right now, just in closing, what can be done? Where should we start right now as a South African nation in learning and applying some of the lessons from a country like Ireland uh, in turning the tide? Where we should start is to follow through with the President's commitment to enhance the quality of our education. The commitment to district development and we must stop forcing rural people to leave their lands where their ancestors are buried. Because that also traumatizes and already traumatized people. I've just been to Kolobin, where the people are making very successful livelihoods out of their land. But they are being forced to accept a company, an Australian company that's very destructive, to mine their land, the dunes of their ancestors. That should be left as they are as part of ecotourism. The combination of rural livelihoods from agriculture, ecotourism, and just the pride and the confidence that people develop in areas such as those, that's what we need to nurture. We mustn't destroy 
in the name of development. Development is about starting where people are. And it cannot be imposed from the top. And we should support our teachers, many of whom come from very difficult circumstances, but there is no place where they can talk about their pain. And therefore, we need a department of education that's not going to be talking about exiting children because they are doing badly at school. They are doing badly at school because children rise to the level of quality of teaching by teachers. By paying attention to the quality of the teaching core, we will raise the level of education. We will then be able to have kids who can integrate whatever vocational training we want them to or they want to go to should be an outcome of free choice, not something you do because you have failed in the foundation years. That's Dr. Rampele, really Rampele. what we need to be doing. Uh, thanks so much uh, for a very thought-provoking conversation this morning. Dr. Mampela Rampela is the co-founder of Reimagine SA, discussing the role of government in dealing with poverty, inequality, unemployment, and how we need to reimagine the future of this country that we call home. It's time now for news.